And now I have a confession to make. At dinner, I thought he was pressing his knee against mine. He turned out to be a table leg. I was disappointed. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Matthew Putman, who is the CEO and co-founder of Nanotronics, and he has a PhD in applied mathematics and physics from Columbia University. Matthew, thank you for joining today. Oh, thanks, Scott. So I want to first start off with your love of music and theater, which I believe uh, were your undergrad uh, majors. Uh, you went on to produce plays and films. Uh, your course, a jazz pianist and composer, you play with some of the greatest, uh, Ahmed Coleman, Daniel Carter, for example. And then, of course, on your free time, uh, you write poems as well. Uh, so, can you tell us a little bit about your kind of earlier career and your other passions before leading into entrepreneurship? Yeah, in, in some ways, these all feel like entrepreneurial acts to me. Uh, the, nothing I have done has been terribly commercial in those spaces. So it's sort of trying to create something from, you know, from something that is, you know, less known or, you know, that I'd like to see in the world that doesn't always. Uh, but no, I have a great passion for the arts and creativity in general. And uh, I, I don't see them as too terribly different from creativity and business or science. But yeah, I did. Uh, I started out doing uh, plays. I had this great mentor that uh, really introduced me to music, from everything from opera to jazz to musical theater. And it just became a, a, a hugely important part of my life that still is. Uh, so, you know, having grown up in this sort of industrial family who, of, of entrepreneurs, you know, I, I, I wanted to, you know, I was also surrounded by music and about around arts from another mentor. So, you know, blending these things and having sort of a richer life to be a part of it has always been important to me. I've never been terribly talented at, at any of them, but they've, they've meant a lot to me and still do. I still play jazz and uh, jazz bands. So it's a really wonderful part of my life. Well, I'm sure you're being uh, quite humble about it. Um, now, you've actually been involved with your parents' business for some time before it was sold. So I guess in some ways, the dynasty of uh, business, industrial businesses, have always been somewhat in your blood. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, my father started a business with my uncle and his and my grandmother when he was 16 years old. And then I worked in my family business when I was uh, much younger than that even. So it's this sort of strange Midwestern industrial entrepreneurship, which, you know, the, the idea of venture capital was not something that entered into my mind as a kid. Um, I knew nothing about it growing up, but I did know about, you know, I was around technology and I was in factories and seeing how to modernize factories. So it's definitely in my DNA and not just you know, in my DNA, but these were my influences in my life. I was incredibly close to um, to my to my grandmother and I've been working with my father now um, since the 1990s. Uh, so it's it's you know nanotronics and and the things I do now are really an evolution of that. It wasn't that that company was acquired and and a phase of my life ended. Yes, that phase slightly ended, but a mindset for what it meant to innovate in manufacturing uh, was something that always has stuck with me. So I'm lucky to continue on. Now my father works at the company still. In fact, I think that uh, last year he was on, you know, one of the lead authors on 14 different patents. So I'm really lucky to have his creativity as a part of, uh, of our company now too. Well, I definitely see that lineage and continuation of innovation and the fact that, you know, your father and your uncle 
and grandmother started so young and it's been so much of who they are and of course uh, uh, being a family business and i could definitely see that lineage continuing with you and the focus on ipm patents which i'll um, come back to in just a, just a few minutes but i want to talk about something a little bit more personal if that's okay with you uh, is that according to a research you've uh, battled with esophageal cancer which is the six most common deadly cancers. Uh, can you tell us about that experience and how that changed your perspectives and, and your lifestyle? Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's only now that this is sort of easy to talk about because it was my, my girl, my, my daughter had just, was just born uh, when this happened. Um, I was still working at the other business, my family business. Uh, so, yeah, I was in my 30s, early 30s, and it was, I mean, it was a really hard time. Um, the the hard part of it was you know hearing that I have a fifty percent chance of surviving right and you know what what type of urgency does that bring what are my priorities and then I'm holding my baby you know so it was it was easy to see those two the, those two important parts of my life uh, but I I think that it it did a few things that were really important uh, for me um, it gave me time. So I, I, I travel all the time, and it's still true, COVID times being the exception here. But I travel all the time, and for that point, I couldn't travel. Um, so I started to, that's when I, I started to dig into research that was more technical than I would have had time to do before. Um, I started writing poetry. I started doing things and exploring creati creatively in a different way than I had before. And I wasn't feeling good, and I was scared, but at the same time, it let me explore a part of what what was you know creatively potential for me these are very little risk associated the risk of dying so I, I i felt i could take chances in areas where i didn't have great background i'm not a great mathematician but i could come up with um some you know some formulations for what became um part of what our business is now so i could do a lot of things that freed me in that way while terrified me in other ways but it is a good thing to turn back to every once in a while and remember what that is. I mean, I think kind of the nation as a whole right now and the world as a whole is experiencing a little bit of this near death, you know, experiences with dealing with COVID and, uh, and isolation. And it's, it's a bit, it's a bit similar to how I felt um, during that time of having cancer. And then it also directly affected the work I did. So I started doing things with regenerative medicine when I was, had a, a university lab. And, um, you know, I, and the work then led to work with esophageal cancer through fixing es esophagus, not just selfishly trying to fix myself, but just in the research drove me in that direction. And so these paths that are taken, uh, I certainly are related. Uh, so I don't look back with, uh, you know, sadness or regret over the time, although I think it was certainly hard on my family, but it, it was a, it was an important time creatively and for perspective. Well, first of all, I want to just uh, recognize the, the difficulty of anyone having to go through cancer. And, and certainly that time period must have been very difficult for your entire family and, of course, yourself. And uh, going back to the thread of innovation uh, being somewhat kind of the core DNA of your family lineage is that even in that difficult time, I think most people would have just really just kind of waited and hoped for the best. But here you've actually decided to uh, apply all that creativity and that rigor into your research and of course that manifested into what it is today um, nanotronic so let's let's get into what that is as far as specializing microscopy for rapid testing analysis and manufacturing and life sciences and medicine and you guys have created a just a massive patent portfolio um, and that seems like it's been a core product strategy Patents ranging from camera and specimen alignment to facilitate large area imaging microscopy to fluorescent microscopy inspection, uh, automatic microscopic uh, focus to even use of AI for feedback control and additive manufacturing to even manipulating optics with gesture control. So th there's just a lot that you guys have done. What exactly are you guys looking to do and how are you guys enabling intelligent factory control? Yeah. No. Uh I just a uh, first thing on patents when when you hear when people hear about getting you know spending a lot of time on an IP portfolio they think of it strictly as you know a, a business strategy for locking in temporary monopolies which it is and 
you know, important for that. But it's also kind of a driver into helping us to, to really organize our thoughts around invention. Uh, you know, it's, it, you, you can have a bunch of rough ideas and brainstorming, but getting down to the business of, well, it's like doing a di dissertation in college, right? But, but it's, you know, getting down to making sure that this is actually something that, you know, is doable. And, can, and repeatable by everybody is really important to us. So the process of patenting is important for that, not just as a business practice. Uh, but what, what we're trying to do, and thank you for mentioning that range of, of um, IP, I, I think that it's about a worldview. Um, that worldview is to us, or to me, really about taking technologies that are incredibly exciting in a lab environment or that, that you know, creative people have and scaling them, um, and you know, as we mentioned, I, I have this industrial manufacturing background, making sure that the technologies that are most exciting, that are most looking towards the future, whether it's the future of electronics to the future of energy, to the future of genomics, to um, the future of regenerative medicine, personalized medicine, to making sure that this great research isn't stuck in a lab. So whatever, whatever methods help make this feasible, um, it, it is something we focus on. You mentioned most of the most recent, one of the most recent patents we got granted, we actually applied for in 2015. Um, so I, I thought it wouldn't happen, which is this, but it's very timely right now, which is a patent to use gesture control for collaborating with robotics and other people and passing control over. So if, if you're collaborating in a factory environment but need to be socially distanced, or I'm collaborating with people across the world, we can now hand off tasks to robots, they can hand off tasks to us, and we can collaborate with our closed loop AI systems as well. So it's really pulling together over these last 10 years, different things that we were doing to understand what the future of building things looks like. And it's really important to us that it is about building things. It's not pure research in the sense that in a hundred years, somebody will come back and look and say, that was a clever idea. It, it doesn't, it's not a success to us unless I see a product come out of what we're doing. And we're really lucky to work with a large genomic sequencing company. And, you know, they're, they're using our tools every day for, you know, the vaccine trials and for uh, uh, pathogen testing. And, you know, that's, that's very fulfilling. That's a factory environment. It's not setting it up for the future. It's seeing it now. And by doing it now, then that lets us iterate so that the future is much better than it was be with, without having a chance to get into a factory. That's a, that's a really great point about the fact that you guys are not just for the sake of research uh, going into these different areas, but it's really around practical applications. And speaking of applications, can you get into a little bit more specific use cases? You mentioned a couple, but also in other areas as it relates to remote collaboration factory control, which you started to kind of go into, as well as telehealth that uses just a control in conjunction with IFC. Yeah, so I, I should start just quickly with IFC, which stands for Intelligent Factory Control. And uh, the, the thing about IFC, um, you know, we used to call it AIPC for Artificial Intelligence. Now everybody puts AI in their titles of their companies and things. So we thought it was too generic, but, but it really is the use of modern, um, of, the, of modern machine learning techniques that are not for uh, gaming or other platforms, but are for um, how you build things. And, uh, and so I, I, a factory no longer to us is a, a bunch of, of little organisms. It's, it's an entire thing. It's an organism in itself. So you're always trying to make the end product optimal, um, not make every node of that process practical. So uh, when you think about this, there's people involved and machines involved. So you know, it doesn't matter what factory you're in. I went into a factory one time, very heavily automated factory, robots everywhere. And I asked the person giving me a tour, um, you know, well, this part, you know, where's the robot that makes this? He's like, ah, you know, it's like this electronic uh, part. And he said, ah, actually, that, I don't know, that's made somewhere else. And I researched, and it was just like 70 factories around the world of hand assembly to make that part. So our idea is to think of the entire product as being one factory, even if it's spread out everywhere. And to have artificial intelligence agents care about how that final product turns out. 
And in order to have that collaboration, people are working and communicating with robots through gestures. Language doesn't matter. It's a new type of language. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's being in a shop with each other, but being in different places and being guided then through, uh, through augmented reality and other tools that are informed by the AI agents to say what to do. So if it's actually something manual, it will tell you where to put your hands and how to move based on the experience that it's gaining during the time. Um, and it, it allows you to collaborate with both people and then also to see where there are changes and anomalies in a process and make moves. So, it, you know, we applied for that much before, that gesture control patent, much before it was possible to do IFC. But now it, it works really well together. Uh, so part of it is seeing, you know, I said, yes, we want to get everything in the world as fast as possible. But part of it is guessing a little bit what the world will be like in a few years. Maybe it'll have an iterative step. But, you know, it sometimes collides nicely and intersects nicely. Um, so the applications are everything from, you know, the largest maker of, of hard drives in the world that power the cloud to the maker uh, of genomics and uh, biologics uh, to a company that makes um, uh, LEDs, especially UV LEDs for, uh, for disinfection um, that can be used in ambient uh, conditions so that it doesn't damage your skin or eyes, um, to now we make a respiratory device. The thing is that w with this kind of system, an AI doesn't care what you make. You know, it, it, it doesn't have a preference of what game it plays. You just have to give, them, give it the game to play. So that's this wonderful opportunity for us to use our imaginations, whether it's something we're making or, you know, a, a customer that we've either sought out or have sought after us. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is great. Um, I want to transition to talk about local microfactories and especially uh, the importance. Is, uh, you know, it's becoming very paramount that I think as a U.S., um, sovereignty, we need to have more of our own capabilities to manufacture, especially high-tech and advanced manufacturing capabilities. Um, can you share what you're doing in New York as it pertains to some of that manufacturing facility and capability? Yeah, and what we're doing is, a, of course, a, a small scale compared to what I, I hope the world starts to do. And I say the world because you know, we're, we're in the United States and I want things to be built in the United States, but I want things to be built in the United States because it's close to our customers. And, you know, I want others to build micro factories everywhere. I want things to be more vertically integrated. As you see, there's an, you know, we have a really clear example um, during this pandemic where, you know, there were not stockpiles of PPE or ventilators. And, you know, we were reliant on an extremely complex supply chain. So we couldn't react quickly enough. And people are speaking about this with vaccines now. You can't react. Mm -hmm. Even if a vaccine is invented, how do you produce fast enough? Supply chains are just enormously complex right now. Uh, we, it's actually, it's, it's almost, um, we've almost lost our imaginations um, as, as, uh, as builders of things to think that it's possible to do in one location. Um, and, you know, we do everything from machining to assembly to having our AI programmers and data scientists looking over the facility so uh, over the factory floor so that they can use the algorithms they're developing for us to build things and then take that same concept to our customers. And I think that this is, I, I think that it's as, it, you know, it's real for us so that we can iterate quickly and, and make things happen. But it's also meant to show people that this is possible now. You know, it, we used to know this as a country. We used to know this as a world. Now, now we see vulnerabilities of big supply mm -hmm. chains and issues, we can get over that. And I don't mean that in a nationalistic way. I mean this in a reaction to being able to, to create technologies that matter for the future and technologies that will allow us to, to thrive as humans. Yeah, you know, I know you're not speaking from a nationalistic perspective, but from my point of view, I think it's uh, hypercritical more than anything else because it also affects our ability to, to defend yeah. uh, because you know, I think the PPE is one example, but in the case of active war, we need to have the capability and the capacity to be able to actually manufacture whatever that we need locally where, yes. where it needs to be sourced. And, and certainly the other thing we didn't talk about and cyber is, war as well. I absolutely. Mean, cyber cyber war war is, absolutely. It's, huge. it's a, it, you know, we, we have a product that works in, in, in security for, you know, prevent man in the middle attacks by 
mm-hmm. using the same production things to look at uh, production variation. But, um, you know, th- this is something that, you know, is terrifying to everybody. They, we're dealing on scales, you know, if you're talking about microprocessors, you're dealing with scales that are so small that intrusions are just nearly impossible to detect. We have a way that we think we can do it, but if, you know, if you can eliminate any vulnerable spots along the way, it's, it's really important. So we're vulnerable in a number of ways. We're vulnerable with resources, we're vulnerable with manufacturing, we're vulnerable with, uh, you know, policy. You know, you're in a trade war, you have policy issues. Absolutely. There are, there are, Absolutely. Yeah, this is a necessity. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and then going back to the manufacturing context is that, you know, with the pervasiveness of IoT and more intelligence that's dispersed and decentralized, you know, being able to hedge and mitigate things like man in the middle attacks and other types of issues become hyper hyper critical because there's a lot of intelligence around manufacturing and know-how as well. And you want to be able to actually protect that and 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 and, and shelter it from potential asset attacks uh, and also internal vulnerability as well. Uh, very interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit more, just a little bit more around the New York facility and what is the objective of that? And is that just um, a case study, and do you plan to uh, no, uh, use no, that as a blueprint to expand? Yeah, yeah. No, and so not, just like how I was talking about labs wanting to get things out of a lab, nothing is just a case study for us. Right. You know, if, if I have a factory, I want to build things of importance in that factory. So we make um, everything from these super resolution microscopes that work throughout all these industries through robotics. Um, now we're making through we're making a talk about moving quickly um, we're making a, a respiration device mm-hmm. um, that that uh, that works that's not invasive uh, f- you know which you know will save lives during covid so well how c- isn't that an enormous change from what you're doing but it's really not it's using the same factory mm-hmm. control and we can build them in our space so it's uh, everything we make out of this space is something that will be used by a customer um, and so it's, yes, it's a case study and that I'd like to bring people in there that don't do anything that we do to show them that it's possible, but we're never going to ship something just for the fun of it, or we're never going to just try something out. You know, it's just like the lab. I, I want to get, I want to get things out into the world. Um, so we have every, th- every department can be in one building. We have a facility in California and Ohio as well. And we'd like to make those the same way where mm-hmm. you have every, you have clean rooms for doing testing for customers. They can come in work with finding different applications for themselves while they can see their own machines being built um, while our engineers are writing software, while our mechanical engineers are tweaking different parts with 3D printers and then taking those 3D prints and putting them onto a CNC machine. So it's, it's this interesting collaborative effort to be able to do design to manufacturing quickly to then moving from that design to manufacturing to scalability. Yeah. So if I'm understanding correctly, this feels almost like a factory as a service. And New York, again, it's a fully operational facility. Do you then plan to have additional footprints, much like what we're seeing with the vertical integration with the gigafactories? Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think that it's, it's certainly something that we would like to put everywhere, you know, rather than us, other than a gigafactory. So other than building an enormous factory, I'd rather have a lot of small factories. Exactly. Um, it's close to the customer. It's also everybody's close enough to to the product to feel what it is. You know, it, it, they're not just one part of it. There's 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 an entire whole, um, and it's visible to them. So, even if you're doing something remotely, you can be attached to the entire facility at once. So you take a forty five thousand square foot facility rather than a few million square foot facility is is a lot different, and you just have several of them. Yeah, I really like the the general direction you guys are going. I think uh, when I think about companies like Locomotors that develops 3D printed cars in a micro factory context, yeah, where sure. I think what you guys are working on is really um, where things need to go is that you guys are agnostic. It really doesn't matter what the product is, uh, but right. you have the know-how capability to be able to turn the key on and be able to quickly pivot to the needs of the clients and just be able to support any variety of chassis and platforms. I mean, that versatility, I think that's that's really the key here in the speed to market. My last question for you is, um, can you share a product or project failure and the lessons learned that you can share with others? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> well, the, the lessons to share with others, I, you know, everybody will take something and figure out better ways because, you know, I, 
Um, I think that I'm, I'll use the one that I'm in the process of because, you know, I, I think that they're, they're sort of failures every day. Now, by the way, I, I, I don't, what I really want to, I'll start with the learning first, is that I never want the entire project to fail. I Meaning I don't, I, nanotronics or tech pro before it, you, you know, I won't accept failure for the entire project, but you have to take a lot of steps in between where you fail on a regular basis. Um, I think that, I, I think that I, I have I have something. We created a um, a product that was associated with IFC that is absolutely foolproof in my mind as being completely aligned with the customer. There is absolutely no reason in my mind people shouldn't buy it. So we raise money, we invest in this, and I completely misunder I, I completely underestimated. Um, inertia in the field and how you you have to deal in psychological ways and and personal ways to you know not tell people that they are doing something wrong even if even you have to appeal to them that together you're going to make something better and so i, I had you know i ended up being very frustrated that i could, was having trouble selling this product because it seemed like a no-brainer um, and it was just a reminder that it's that it is always a collaboration, um, and that collaboration is sometimes starts from a point that seems irrational. When you get to know people, it's not so irrational anymore. It's careers that people have built. It's mm -hmm. problems that they've had that I didn't understand, and that's what'll make us stronger. Even if sometimes you go through hard times of having developed something that you need to, you know, switch gears on and pivot some. And this is this you know happens all the time. And hopefully less, hopefully I learn from it and it happens less over time. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And I've been joined by Dr. Matthew Putman, who is the CEO of Nanotronics. Thanks for joining today, Matthew. Thanks, Scott. It was great. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.